What's happening, people? Welcome to It's All Black Academic with me, your host, Jordan Jarrett Bryan. Right, on this week's show, we've got a really, or oh, another important discussion I think we need to be having. Um, I wanted to have it for a little while, but recent events um, have made this discussion, I think, more prevalent and even more important than ever. We want to have a discussion around the issue of consent and asking the kind of central question, I guess, do men really understand what consent is? And I understand that that will be... Um, quite offensive to a lot of men that I, that I think the idea of consent is quite black and white, um, but I think there are some shades to it. There's a lot of nuance to the issue of consent. This obviously um, came to the fore for the, after the tragic killing of Sarah, uh, Sarah Everard uh, recently, who was, who, was, who was killed. And that brought up the discussion of the disrespect uh, towards women, and that can lead to them being killed and murdered by men. Um, to have this discussion, I've got three fantastic uh, guests with me this week. I'm joined by the Labour MP for Streatham, Bel Ribeiro Addy. Thank you for joining me today on the show. Good to be on. Um, I'm also joined by Sace Holmes Lewis here, who runs Mentivity. They're an organisation that aim to mentor young boys and get them on the right path in life. Thanks for joining me as well. And I've also got Casey Robinson, um, who's from Beyond Equality. They work with young men and boys to give them a chance to think about who they would like to be. Um, and I think the reason why I've got you two in particular wrong is I think the discussion needs to be framed through the prison of men and boys. And I think they have, I think you'd agree, you're nodding that they have the, to do the work here to ensure that we, we protect young girls and women. Um, let me start with you, uh, Belle, because you're an MP for a, a neighbouring uh, area to where we are right now. I know, um, I'm the other you're, you're the right, right, there you go. <laughs> so it was very close down the road again in Clapham where Sarah Everett was killed. Mm -hmm. First of all, what has been the, the reaction amongst the community and the response from the community to what happened to that particular young woman? Well, there was a, see, an outpouring, definitely a lot of women were identifying with what happened to her. Um, and, you know, thinking about where she walked through, somewhere I've walked myself, because I used to live down by that way. And thinking about all the times they were walking themselves and they were scared. And actually, during that period of time, what the police told us is that a lot of women in response to the appeal for information about Sarah actually came forward and reported incidences that had happened to them in the past couple of months. So they hadn't felt comfortable to do that before, uh, which was worrying. And other than that, there was a major kind of outpouring online of people victim shaming. Um, and so there was a massive pushback back against that. So victim shaming in that they were talking about all of the things women should be doing to keep them safe. And it's very interesting what you said at the, the, right at the beginning about this being an issue of what men need to do, um, because it is an issue of what men need to do. Women don't need to, you know, take extra precautions all the time to keep themselves safe. We do. Sarah did that. She took all the well-lit streets home and this still happened to her. But there is this idea, as, as, as well as the sexism in society overall, that women should be doing stuff. We either shouldn't be wearing something, we shouldn't be walking somewhere, um, we shouldn't be doing X, Y or Z, but that's completely wrong. We should have the right to walk freely, whatever, at what time, and people should respect that right. Um, Sais, I don't want to focus too much on the killing of um, Sarah Everard. I want, to I want to focus on what that killing brought up. And the discussion at the back of, of, of her killing was around the responsibility of men and their role in this. Because I believe in the same way that racism isn't black people's problem, I don't think misogyny and sexism and the killing of women is women's problem. It affects them, but racism affects us, but it's not our problem. Does the question, do men understand consent as a man, offend you? It doesn't offend me because it's never been an issue for me. Um, I have four sisters and um, as I'm getting older, I'm realising how important it is to understand what women are going through and put women's feelings into context when it comes to consent. I mean, I've never had any problems with those kind of boundaries in any relationship that you're in and has boundaries and is underpinned by boundaries. But I think what we've got to understand is that people have a very kind of entitled sense to, in society, especially young people now where they think they want things immediately. And if they don't get things that they want, then they feel that they should take it. And we've had a lot of instances with young men that have now unfortunately gone to prison because they've failed to understand those boundaries between women. And it's because that they feel that they're entitled to take what they want. And that's wrong. And I think we've got to really start this from the home, but also in education, have this conversation with young people from early. Really understand what they can and cannot do. Um, Casey, let me ask you now. Do, when I've dis discussed this, this uh, show, planning the show with some of my male friends, Many of them 
were, were, were offended maybe a bit strong, but they, they, they took issue with the idea that some men don't understand consent. And what I think that, was, that came from, where that came from was the idea that, well, I don't rape girls, I don't sexually abuse women, so obviously I understand what consent is. Explain why you think there's maybe a nuance to that question that isn't as black and white as, if I'm not beating up or raping women, I understand consent. Yeah, I think that's the common issue that we get with this uh, conversation about consent, like the idea that these these good men and bad men, you know, these two categories that everyone can fit in. And so if you're not raping and killing and assaulting, that you automatically go in that good man category, which can therefore mean that when you do hear a question like that or a comment about men not understanding consent or men needing to do more, it feels like an attack. It feels like someone's coming at you and accusing you of something that you know you haven't done. But when we're talking about consent, when we're talking about, you know, equality, between between genders, we're really talking about everybody being involved and that's what it's about. And really recognizing that it isn't just the extent of rape and murder that we're talking about. It's this culture, you know, whether we're talking about rape culture, whether we're talking about this culture of inequality that we really need to address. And so that's what I think the nuances that's being missed is the idea that, okay, great that you're not raping and killing somebody, but there's more than that. You know, the idea that if you are here and you're your boys making a joke or you're hearing a comment and you're not calling out and being like, no, nah, actually that isn't that you shouldn't be saying that, you know, that's actually rooted in violence. That's sexist, that's offensive. Like, and I don't think we need to necessarily go think about X, Y, Z person in your life. Like, think about people. We don't want to talk about people in that way. And so I think that it's really important to get away from this dichotomy of being good and bad and just realizing that we're all capable of potentially leaning into bad habits, ideologies, and to really address them in that way. So I think that's one of the most important things to figure out. And that's usually how we can open up this conversation by being like, how are you contributing to this in different ways? What are you not speaking up about? It isn't just the rape and the murder and the really extreme acts of violence. Mm. It's that culture that we know is prevalent and that everyone I think I would like to say is aware of. So to to that point, guys, I remember in the days after the Everard uh, killing, Certain people came out online, a few high profile people talking about the fact that the, the raping and killing of women actually isn't that high. And they got bashed for it. It's like, this is not the time to bring that sort of thing up. And I don't want to talk for those people, but I think the point they were trying to make in a maybe very clumsy way, and I want to know if you agree with this or not, is that there's a spectrum here, right? And it ends with women being murdered and killed. But at the start of that spectrum, it's subtleties like, men on the tube, you know, pushing up against a woman. That's not killing a woman, but that's the kind of thing that affects, I'd I'd assume, more women than being raped and killed. Did you have any kind of sympathy to the idea that the discussion isn't around the percentage of men who murder and kill women, but the everyday indiscretions and what I call the disrespect of, of women, that's where the discussion needs to be more so? I think even with that, the, this pushback about the idea that not a lot of women are raped, that's not true. Mm-hmm. What happens is that not a lot of cases end up in court. Okay. It's, it's a complete disgraceful situation where before you even are able to, to talk about it, you have to jump through so many different hurdles. There have been so many cuts, let's say, to those services. So if you're going straight to the police, you may have to you know, do many, many different interviews. And even with that, your case may never end up in court. And if it does go to court there's a very, very small chance that people actually get convicted on rape cases. And when they do, it's a really, really low amount of time. And so the Victims Commission has actually said that rape in this country has effectively been decriminalised. Do, do, do you agree that, that the percentage is, is, is not high, but there's still far too many women being raped and murdered, and that still needs to be the focus alongside the invoke commas microaggressions of what you shout out of a window to a woman, the way you talk to a woman in a, in a, in a nightclub? I think a lot of time numbers quite honestly make me a bit uncomfortable um, because (laughs) it's just like they can be manipulated in so many different ways. And so this idea of there like not being enough women being attacked is a reason why we don't talk about this. Like that's another reason, a way how these numbers have been manipulated to kind of stop us from addressing an issue. And so the fact is that if there has been one woman, one person that's been assaulted, that's enough. That's enough to do something about it. That's enough to care. And so I think it was the UN statistic that came out the other week that 97% of women have been sexually harassed in the street. Again, I don't know exactly what it was. With this and saying reality is that all women or even marginalized genders will be like, well, duh, we know because we've experienced it. So I think that again, like in that conversation, I want to push away from the numbers, like listen to people. People have been saying this, like there's there's no one that is re- re- really saying, I've got no idea what's going on here and that we should look at this number and therefore we're not doing anything because the reality is that you do know that's happening. You're hearing this happening around you and you're either choosing to ignore it or you've got some sort of privilege that's allowing you to ignore it. 
until we have a society that all women, when all women are safe, you know, through our actions and what we do in day to day, people are not going to understand that, you know, what women are going through. I mean, you have to make this normalised in terms of the conversation. And I think it's important that we keep having these conversations, but also we have to, as you said, direct it towards the boys from a very, very young age, because as I said, this is what young boys are seeing in society and seeing this normalised in television, in sports, in every facet of society. So they're actually just carrying us out and children are going to be what they see. So it's important that we now look at what we're doing and how we address it when it happens to women. And the fact that we were saying, oh, well, it's not many women, the fact that it happens to any woman in society enough. is enough. It's more than enough. So what are the, the boys that you work with, what are the examples of toxic masculinity that you're seeing that is playing itself out in, in the disrespect of women and, and more? It's, especially when you're in a classroom environment and you've got young boys and teenagers, you know, being kicked out of school, pupil throw units, they've got a lot of, you know, testosterone, a lot of, you know, emotional regulation going on and just their hormones are all over the place. When they're talking to women, it's in a very sexualized manner, but this comes down to the music they listen to, the things that they're watching, you know, the films and television shows that they're watching. This is all normalized, so they think that this is normal until they're challenged on it by a person that they respect and understand them are empathetic to how it feels to a woman, they're never gonna understand that until they're in a position where they feel vulnerable and there's nothing that they can do, because that's what women are, are normalizing and kind of experiencing. And how do you challenge those boys and what is the reaction to the challenge? Through conversation, you've got to respect young people for, so that they can respect you so you can have these conversations. If you don't do that, then they're not gonna voluntarily engage with you. It comes down to respect. So we don't routinely respect young people in society. We don't make them part of the decision-making process. It's always us in a room deciding what we're going to do for children with no children in the room. So they don't feel empowered enough to feel that they can do, you know, make the changes in their lives. So that's why we have a lot of young people just normalising these types of behaviour. Do you, what's the work that you're doing with the boys you're working with to ensure that similarly they're growing up to understand that women are not to be spoken about in a certain way, treated in a certain way? Because this, a bit like racism for me, this starts young. Once you get to a certain age, if you're still professionally abusing people, for me, I look at it like you're past help. You're going to think what you're going to think until, you, until whenever. But the young ones, they're the ones that I'm assuming you guys think we need to get to those young boys first and foremost so that they are growing up in an environment where they're seeing it normalised that women are, treat, women are treated with respect and well. Yeah, so definitely, I think, I mean, I wouldn't say you're like, you're past and beyond help. I definitely think that's that. Just, that's, <laughs> just me, I mean, like, that's just me. <laughs> we can, yeah, we'll go with the pessimist road for some of it, but like, I, I would like to think of some hope for people. Um, but I think definitely like with the, with the young boys or young men, when you're talking to them, it's giving them spaces to talk about this. And often, a lot of the time, they have never considered this. And I don't say never considered it like they're not capable. They've never been given the space. They've never been asked the question. You know, they've never been put in a nurturing environment where they feel supported, where they're even given the vocabulary to even have these conversations. What's, what's the question? Sorry, what's the question? Questions about, you know, how we're relating to one another. What does it mean to be a man? How is your masculinity playing out? You know, what do you feel when your friend or your boys act like this? Or how do you respond to your teachers when they talk to you about that? All these different questions, which they know is happening to them and they're actually very articulate about and have a lot to say. Mm. But when we're talking about them being in school, are they given environments to talk about that? Most of the time, no. Mm. You know, if they're around with their friends, are they, you know, encouraged? Where are we seeing that dialogue? Where are they maybe emulating these conversations that they're seeing because they're not seeing them? And so often when we enter in these conversations with them, there's maybe a little bit of defensiveness, but a defensiveness because, you know, they don't want to look silly, you know, they don't want to say something wrong, which is a very human thing to not want to happen. But then when you get into it, you know, they do have a lot of opinions and they do want to express and talk about it and, you know, really realise what's happening to them and what they're seeing happening to their friends as well. And so not to say that they're unconsciously kind of getting involved in this and unconsciously sexist. There is, there's, of course, there's always a conscious aspect to it, but when you're never given that kind of environment to kind of explore what that means and how that's relating to you I think it can be can be quite scary you know you can have I remember a conversation with one boy and we were talking about consent and we were talking about what it means to consent you know what does consent look like what does it sound like and we were doing it as a very like almost basic activity but have we ever had that conversation with with children with with young people no do we even know what it look what does our body do what does our you know our face do do we get sweaty hands like all of these things that we can start to learn to read people and so they were, I think, like 14, 15 years old. And he came over to me and he was like, so, like, boys that have to consent to sex, like, I thought that just women had to do that. Like, I actually have to say yes. And he was genuine. Like, he had never, like, been asked the question or really thought like, that he had to. He always thought in his mind, 
men and boys just want to have sex. Like, that's what they want to do. But I've got to check that, like, a woman is cool with it if we're talking about heterosexual relationships. But, you know, and so that to me was one of those moments where I was like, wow, like, look at what we're not doing. Look mm. at actually, we are creating this problem. You know, we're feeding into it by not giving them the spaces to actually understand their own body rights. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that's that's one of the main things I think is so important, having that space to do it. So, so how, how important is, or how important a factor is the lack of sex education here? Because if boys from a young age at school or wherever it needs to be are taught about sex education and that being more than just about the act of intercourse, how big a role is that playing in what the boys then grow up to, to, to believe women's roles are or what women do? And as you say, you know, I want to have sex, therefore, that's going to happen. That's sort of how, how big a problem is the lack of sex education in, in this problem? I, I think it is. It's a major issue, but it's about what's normal in society overall. Mm -hmm. So it hasn't been normal for us to teach these things in school. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been normal for us in the past to talk about consent. It's something that's done more recently. So um, think about when we were all growing up, what we thought was normal. Um, when I was growing up, it was normal for people to catcall at you in the street. And it wasn't something that you would necessarily challenge. It's even normal when you're in a club for someone to touch your bum and you just brush it off and walk on. Um, but it's about teaching people that these things are not normal. It's not okay to do that. Um, so in education, yes, definitely. But it's about also what, we've, what we see out in society, what we see on television. Um, and when I think about some of the things we would watch when we were younger, um, I don't want to call out any one show because it might cause problems. But in terms Easy. of what was, yeah, in, yeah, in terms of what was normal um, and what was considered funny, even in some ways, you would see so many situations where a woman would be touching in an appropriate way, or she would be catcalled on the street, and it was like, oh, it's just lads being lads, mm -hmm. and that that was accepted. So, what, what is being done in? Let's look at the, here at Lambeth in our schools here. How much? Is sex, I went to school in Lambeth and the, my, mm. my, my school, the education, sex education was, was basic at best. What has been done here in Lambeth to ensure that in schools, and that's what you can control, you can't control what's on TV, but what you can control is what happens in our schools here. What has been done in that setting to ensure that people get, boys and girls, get a better sex education experience? I think they're talking about it more in, um, I may be calling it wrong now, PSHE lessons, P mm -hmm. yeah. maybe I went to school some time ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, those, they're talking about it more in those lessons, but again, it's not getting enough attention. And you find when you, and, 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 and you'll probably be able to speak to this better than I do, when young people come out of those lessons, um, if it's, well, actually, with an external organisation, they're probably a bit better. When it's, in, when it's their teachers themselves, they're not necessarily taking it as seriously as they should. Okay. And you can see from how, well, recently, we've heard just how many young people are complaining about sexual assault within school, mm -hmm. being touched inappropriately. Um, so it's not having enough of a desired effect because I suppose it's not challenging the culture overall. Mm -hmm. And, and what, what are you doing, doing you mentioned at the start there, mm. that the, the conviction rate for people who are, who are raped or sexually assaulted is, is stupidly low. How hard is it in your job to, to tell women, if you are sexually abused, if you are raped, Go to authorities and they will, they will go through the process. How difficult is it for you to say that with, with on one side, but yet knowing the conviction rate is going to be so low, or well, the chance of a conviction is so low? It's really hard. It's really hard because you, you've got people coming to you with a range of different issues, and, and more often than not, you, you have to encourage them to speak up. You have to encourage them to come forward. But after you know, dredging up all, all of that, it may come to nothing. And I suppose the government argue back at us when we complain about the low conviction rates that actually the maximum conviction rate is life. And I'm like, but who have you given life recently? People get more for fraud than they do for, for rape. They, they get more for fraud than they do for paedophilia. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's, there's so many different kind of discrepancies in not just what the maximum sentence is given, but what at the judge, given the facts of the case and given cases that have gone past, actually gives someone. So if, you're, if you know that actually, or if you've heard within society, that when you do these things, nothing happens to you, you're going to carry on doing it. Think of all the major cases of paedophiles. Um, Jimmy Savile, for example, he was able to carry on doing that because he knew that no one would come for him, and no one did until after he died. Indeed. Um, so we're about the same age. I've spoken just earlier on there about what we can do to, to educate young boys. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about men our age. What work do we need to be doing in, in, um, in ensuring that women feel safer and respected? Because 
I, I totally agree with your point that there isn't like a bad guy and a, and a good guy. I think that's a really weird way of looking at it. But there are things that even if I'm honest, I would check myself and be like, right, I said something and that wasn't really cool. Or I think back to when I was younger, a lot of my friends will be in a rave or be in a dance and even just to kind of pulling a woman's hand yeah, towards you. Yeah. I never did that and I never mm-hmm. did that, but I never did that one because I was too scared to get a box in the mouth. <laughs> it wasn't because I was a gentleman. It was, I was just too scared to get a punch in the face. I was never that guy. But when, I, when that happens now, what do we need to be doing, our generation, to ensure that we're doing the work to ensure the women in our communities mm. feel safe and respected? It's just having the conversations again. It's back to education, but holding each other accountable. Like just understanding how we treat our women and how we disrespect our women on a daily basis. The way we may refer to our women in certain conversations and circles. Um, like just how we normalise the word like, oh, we're bitching. Like, mm-hmm. why do we use that kind of terminology? Mm-hmm. And I think it's just challenging each other when we're using that type of language and how we're treating our women. But also just in terms of like relationships. Like if you know that your friend is cheating on his, on, on, you know, his woman, like how, how are you going to challenge him on that and say to him, look, that could be my sister, that could be your sister, that could be your mum. Mm. How would that affect that person emotionally? And I think it's how we're approaching these conversations and how we're thinking about how it is felt. If we don't do that, then we don't really understand how we can make those changes. So it's so important that we really are empathetic about how we are kind of carrying out ourselves in terms of women and how we're treating them. Just going back to the, the consent thing as well, do you find the word consent in this whole kind of phrasing problematic in itself? Because what is consent? To what extremity do you, is, is consent something? You hear lots of stupid people talking about, I need a contract before I can kiss this person or hug this person before. But, but, but what, why is consent a problematic phrase to using in terms of how we are around women and in terms of relations as well? I mean, I think it's problematic and not problematic in a lot of ways. It's difficult in a lot of ways. I think there's this whole ideology as well that like consent isn't sexy. Like what it means, like this whole thing, like, yeah, I need a contract. Like, no, you don't. Like you don't. And that, this is what I'm saying again about really understanding what does consent look like? Like, have we ever been taught to know what consent looks like? Because the idea is that like in this whole thing that yes is yes and no is no, right? We can say the thing, but it, we know that it doesn't happen like that. We know that we don't have, we don't interact with each other like that. So how are we getting to understand that? You know, and I think that's the thing where there's the divide because it is this sort of rhetoric around it that it's so black and white, but it isn't, it isn't black and white. And we know it isn't black and white, one, because people are being assaulted. You know, this idea that if you get a no, that therefore means like convince me. That's t- tends to we, what you see as well. You know, you see it in a movie and you see a girl and she might like go back and she's like, oh no, and then like, in the end she actually does it and so you're genuinely taught like I think I remember growing up watching that that like well do they do they have to convince me like is is that what it is am I just like holding back because I actually want to hold back or I think I should hold back because god forbid I'm like called uh you know the s word for doing these things and so I think that that's why it gets so difficult because we don't actually understand as a society I don't think what consent looks like because so often we are coerced into things we are coerced into what these things are mm-hmm. we're doing. Mm-hmm. Example of it, I'm trying to think of like, even example as a way that you can think about this in, in a sexual way. So like, okay, scenario, like you've got husband and wife and they've had an argument. They go to bed and then he comes to bed and he tries something. And so she knows, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not feeling this, like you've annoyed me, like I don't want to be here. But she also knows if she doesn't do it, doesn't have sex with him, he's going to either kick off or maybe be in a bad mood for the next few days. And so it ends up happening, okay? So in that scenario, has she consented to the sex act? Or has she consented to the fact that she doesn't want to fight or deal with his mood for the next three days? Do you and know that's that never the, even used to be illegal? Uh, like you could, to, yeah. A man could rape, could his, rape wife, his wife, wife, wife yeah. Exactly, because, so there's a legacy yeah. of that there as well. So that's that where that's that come from. Ago. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly, it wasn't, I mean, I've no, I'm not long, 60s mm. maybe? No? I think maybe, maybe it might have been the 80s only, 80s, no. 90s, okay, that they actually, changed, there. <laughs> actually changed the law. So up until then, if you went to court and you were complaining, um, and, and you know, as part of your divorce, you were saying that your husband raped you, wouldn't count, wouldn't and you couldn't take him to court for rape because you were married, and so, um, yeah, consent in that way wasn't, wasn't considered. So I think, you I mean, I use the example of a husband and wife, but I think it could be just two either partners together, whether that be long-term, short-term, who knows, but I think that whole idea that, oh, are we actually consenting to that sex act itself, or consenting to the fact that you don't want the repercussions of saying no, because we have to really recognise there are repercussions of saying no, to the extent of 
rape and murder, but there's also, there are other repercussions to say no as well. There's the hostility, there's maybe some anger, maybe another altercation, like all of those things. And so I think that when we don't even dissect that and understand that that's an act of coercion, you know, and really understanding what that means to be coerced into something because you don't want to deal with the, with the material impact of what's going to happen when you do actually say no. So I think conversations like this, I think I've maybe gone off from your question. No, no, no. <laughs> you know, like conversations like this to me are also really, really important because I think that, again, that even sometimes that like black and white, and I don't want to say black and white because, you know, it, it, we do know when these things are assault, when they are rape, but like we don't talk about coercion. We don't talk about coercion, even in our own day-to-day -day lives, what it feels to be coerced to do something, you know? And so I think that even a conversation like that, taking it away from sex can also be really beneficial. So you can start to kind of really understand where those boundaries sit for you and also understand how you can understand someone else's boundaries at the same time too. And I wanted to ask you also about the idea toxic masculinity and how you see that playing out in the boys you work with, if you do indeed at all? So the, the, I have a, this phrase like toxic masculinity. So like, you don't like it, do you? It's not, okay. It's not like toxic masculinity. Okay, so this is my thing. So like, and this is where I'm like getting yeah, controversial. So a friend of mine wrote a, an article about this, about like how toxic masculinity doesn't make sense as a phrase because Fundamentally, like if we actually break down like masculinity, a lot of the times we're not coming up with very positive things here. <laughs> so to call it toxic masculinity is like saying toxic Just double down. Yeah, like yeah. toxic murder, like yeah. as if there's a non-toxic <laughs> form of murder. Do you know what I mean, it doesn't really make sense. So again, like I don't want to be like. Gram grammatic here with this but no, no, good, good, even good, just good. to get in the depth but I think that's also important too to like have a conversation and figure out actually what do we mean by this so I guess in general like toxic masculinity is this kind of overpowering dominant arrogant unemotional uh, aggressive person supposedly and not toxic is being and a responsible man but still manly but exactly so yeah. there's still that in it so like so I'm not like gonna like scream at you or call you names or attack you but like I still will assert my dominance over yeah. you and that's the positive <laughs> bit of it like that's where I'm kind of lost with it so I think that but I think that's the point, isn't it? That like when we're even talking with boys and young men, like the fact that we still don't really understand what this means in, even in the language of itself. So if we haven't even defined it and named it, how can we actually start to address it? How can we actually start to talk about it with them? So I think that, not that we would go to that depth with like a nine year old, you know, but kind of in the sense of saying, really getting them to break down what's masculinity for you? What does it mean to be a man? Like, what are these things? How are you seeing that? How are you showing up? How are you being taught? What are your, either it being your parents, your carers, your friends, your teachers mm -hmm. who have an enormous impact on kids, which I think we don't always think about yeah. um, and don't always take into consideration because, you know, in a non COVID world, please, that, that'd be It's coming, it's coming. Um, <laughs> you know, they spend the majority of their time with their teachers. And so, what kind of behavior is being modeled from them too? How are you know how are they learning from that kind of space which also as well when you think about schools not to be too political but it's a it's, there's a power relationship there there's a dominance and a you know listening to your teacher not being heard out and we know for loads of different issues that are coming out in schools now that kids aren't being listened to when they're when they've got a problem or when there's something that they need to talk about because it doesn't fit in with the structure and the schedule of the day so these messages are coming in so many different directions for them and that then channels into these disastrous things like assault and... and it comes back then down to their influences as well because of what are they seeing and what are they experiencing and how are they learning. If they're not learning at school, they're going to learn through their peer groups, which may not always be positive. Also, access to social media. Kids can access things and content that we never would have dreamed of seeing when we were young. You know, young people learn about sexual relations through, unfortunately, pornography, like which can access on Twitter, Snapchat, which is very dangerous. You know, for young people. Ten years old boys are now ten years old. They first access yeah. porn. And I have to ask my boy. My son is fourteen. I have to ask him. You know, what have you seen? What's the mm -hmm. worst thing you've seen online? I have to ask him those things and have those conversations because no one would have asked us those things before. It might have been a film or a movie. It might not have been real, but children are seeing real things happen now, and they can watch these things. You know, people dying, people being you know sexually abused. They can see these things and not unsee it. So we've got to really normalise these conversations, as I said, in schools, importantly, but in the home. As parents, we've got to say, look, if you see this or something that upsets you, you need to come talk to me. Mm -hmm. You know, ch children are seeing these things and being traumatised and really just carrying that trauma and they're trying to identify who they are. You know, when I was eight, nine, I had an identity crisis. I didn't know who I was. Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to conform to the norm, which it might be in social media and what you think everyone else wants you to be, then it's not actually you, you know? So you're, you're going to really have those struggles and that, that internal battle between who you want to be and who you think you should be. So young people really need to be protected in that respect, but also included in those conversations, having those difficult conversations from an early age, those uncomfortable conversations about sex, about boundaries, so that they're used to it. And that's the only way we're going to solve it. You mentioned there what young people are seeing online and how that kind of perpetuates a lot of what they think about girls and, and women. 
the the video that came out from uh, Cardi B and Nicki Minaj, very controversial video that came out a few months ago. So I flagged that video because what I'm interested to hear from you guys is um, those sorts of videos. On the spectrum, how, where does that, where is the dial in terms of women shaming and women blaming to actually having a conversation around a, what are we putting out there into the world? And secondly to that, the reaction that young boys are having or are supposed to have to a video, which for me, is, it's soft porn. That's just my opinion. That is their right to do that. But where on that dial is, is, we don't want to go to saying that women can't be sexual or be naked in music videos, that's their business. But how does that become problematic for the young boys that you're in particular talking to, to tell them that, to respect women and, and that sort of thing? A lot of emotions about this. Okay, so give it to me. That I think that video in particular is a video of two women with agency, agency over their bodies and their sexuality and everything. And so, not to say that it's appropriate for children or like you would you should put a five year old in front of it. That's one hundred percent not what I'm saying. But you're actually seeing women consenting to what they want to do to these sexual acts, to actually enjoying sex, to actually knowing that there's that they're doing with their partners and they're they're liking it they like being set they like being sexual that doesn't seem negative to me you so know and so i think like again to, to go forward to your point isn't i'm not saying that that like the idea that it's child appropriate but it wasn't made for children either so no. there's also a responsibility there to understand that yes and we know that kids are accessing porn and accessing these things that they can't you know they're I, i'm not a parent i don't want to speak to what parents should and shouldn't do but the idea that there is some sort of control you should have of what your kids are seeing that video wasn't made for children but if you do see that to see a woman, you know, with agency over her body, surely that's more important. See, let me push back on that point then, because some people, um, in particular men, would say they think they're in control, they think they're in charge, they think they're they have the power in that video as two mega pop stars. But the reality is, is that the person that came up with that video is probably going to be a man. The person that owns that record label, the tune's coming out on, is probably a man. It's going to be men. I don't know the stats for sure, but it's going to be men that are going to be. Um, uh, formulating around that video and talking about it in a, in a very toxic way. So they may think they're in charge as two women doing what they want with their bodies and they're earning good money from that video. But the reality is, is it's actually not, they're not in charge. I just gonna say the problem with that is it comes back to what a woman's doing mm -hmm. and how what she does is influencing what a man does. I think they, they should be able to do that and mm -hmm. yes I agree with you very graphic um, <laughs> definitely should be something that you shouldn't let your kids watch because it's not something they can can be explained mm -hmm. to them at their young age but at the same time it definitely shouldn't be if women do this then men should talk to them about this it should be women are human beings just like men when they do whatever they want that should just be it it shouldn't be a cause for you to disrespect them just because they behave in this way. Because men do loads of different things. Of and in fact, sometimes in the way that we discuss things, we actually, we actually let men off for quite a bit. Yeah. And I think saying that um, they, you know, watching these women in this way is actually encouraging them and sending the wrong message is letting men off again. So yeah. this is why I wanted to kind of ask that how difficult is it for the boys that you work with who see that video and are probably sharing, have you seen this? How, is it difficult for you then to kind of talk to these boys about respecting women? And I'm, I'm saying that with the caveat that they're being disrespected and that may not be the case, but does it make your job harder? The thing with, yeah, it does make it harder. But the thing is with your children, they're going to be honest. They're going to see, say what they see. So if they see a woman who's just cavorting in, you know, lingerie, looking like soft porn, they're going to think that she doesn't respect herself because that's what society's told them. So that's what they're going to believe. So it reinforces that. So they think that they should act accordingly in terms of that disrespect or that woman doesn't respect herself, then I can call her these different words because that's what she is. So they just reinforce the stereotypes that they see in society. So for us now to unpick that just comes down to the conversations that you're having. That, all right, you know, let me challenge that in an elegant way. Like, okay, cool, well, why do you have to refer to her like that? What if someone referred to your mum like that? Oh, why are you talking about my mum like that? No, I'm not. <laughs> but what I'm saying to you, you is that... You don't like it when yeah, someone's about but yeah, your mum. Yeah, so it's the same thing. If we don't respect the, everyone has the same respect your mum, you know, your, your mum with, and people in society, you should respect them the same, same way you respect your mum. So if you do it that way and you pose it from a personal perspective, young people are going to make it more personal and learn from that because they're going to think, you know what, if someone said that about my mum, I'm going to get upset, I'm going to be agitated because I can't emotionally regulate. So therefore, I'm going to respect that woman with the same respect I showed to my mum.
that's how I will pose it and that's how, how you reinforce that learning with young people. But actually, I remember actually asking a group of friends of mine, asking some young guys, this is when we were in sixth form, and asked them, why do you look cool girls like that? Mm. And they were like, oh, but you know, I said, but it's not nice. You're like, yeah, but if I call her like that and she's okay with it, then I know she's good to go. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, that's, that's, not, that's not okay. But that, that was their explanation yeah. for it. Yeah. If, if it wasn't like that with her and if I wanted to treat her with more respect, I'd come at her a bit differently. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, sorry. I was saying there's just a lot going on here with this idea that she's not respecting herself. And I think what you're talking about is the male gaze, essentially. Yeah. Like this idea that we see the world through this very, like, heteronormative male, usually, like, white uh, gaze. And that's pretty much how, you know, particularly where, you know, we've grown up in the UK, we've, that's that lens that we've had on the majority of stuff that we've kind of seen and consumed. And so that argument is like that, you know, well, they, they probably are being managed by a man or that video has been directed by a man, whatever, like... That reality, yeah, yeah, but also at the same time. But then again, you've just you're coming at women for the fault of men. So again, that if that is and the that's case, why I was very careful that, at the top it, to say oh, where on the spectrum are we blaming women for that and having conversations that maybe need to be had about that sort of content and the reactions to the because that, with that video it becomes inconceivable that a woman could want to do that mm. Mm. because and that's where we're, that's what we're talking about here again so like they're talking about boys saying women aren't, dis- aren't respecting themselves but re- how are they not respecting themselves they're doing what they want so but the idea is that a man isn't controlling them and so therefore you know we talk about women who are you know we call them words where they're going around and sleeping with lots of people we call them different things and we call women bad things for that but we don't call men bad things for that because the idea is that a man hasn't got control over her anymore and that's where the criticism is coming in that's why it gives them permission to do that and so I think what's so important here is that consistently when we talk about the ways in which women might have certain sexual agency and want to do certain things with their body you're, you're just influenced by like patriarchal culture like it's the male gaze that are well, of course it is. We've had no choice. That's all that it's ever been. So, but then the reality is that we also still need to move away from the fact that, you know, women can still want to actually do like that, that they do have agency over themselves. They're not like robots just taking in everything in and, you know, and not able to make a decision for themselves. Then that then leans back to that we need to go in and protect them. And then you're back to men controlling women again. Even parents do it. Mm. And they love their kids more than anybody. They mm. will high five their sons and they'll lock up their daughters. Yeah. <laughs> it's... Mm. It's just become the way of the mm. world. Um, I don't know if you guys all saw um, Michaela Cole's brilliant work last year, I May mm. Destroy You. Um, I thought it was a very powerful and important piece mm. of work. Um, what were your takeaways from that? Because it, it explores the idea of relations and consent. And it, it spun it in a really interesting way that I hadn't have seen it before. It involves people who, who, who are gay as well. It's, it, there's a guy in there that is raped. Um, I also got flagged as well recently that in an episode of Bridgerton, there's a bit where I've, I've only seen the first two episodes, but someone gets raped in that as well. And it's not noticed and picked up on. Mm-hmm. And that might have been bec- deliberately to make the point that what we consider rape is very black and white, whereas all these other shades are technically rape as well. So on um, I May Destroy You, what were your takeaways from that, first of all? I loved it. I, I mean, I say I loved it. I had to watch it, like, with a break in between every single episode because mm. it, it's heavy. Yeah, it's right. um, I think, obviously, like, to see also as well, to see, like, your community being represented in that way, I don't think a lot of people I had never seen on TV before, like, seeing parts of London be represented like that, like... You don't see that on TV. I think that was important too. I think also what she did in that is show parts of consent that we don't start to talk about. Um, you know, when the guy who had obviously taken the condom off mm-hmm. and so that kind of thing. That what's what is there a name for it? There's a name for it. There is, yeah. I don't know why it's called, but there is a name for it. It's gone. It will come back. And so that, and also again, just that what we always called that blurred line between what consent is and isn't, you know, the idea that she was drunk um, and then therefore something happened to her then, like, they're not blurred lines. Like, and it actually showed on on screen, you actually saw that this isn't difficult to understand. This isn't complicated. This isn't like, we're not sure, we're not sure about whatever was here. So I think that it did open up a really important conversation about really what it means to represent that in a way that can be hard to watch because it is hard to watch but also it does it does show you a new narrative that we really don't get given very often about about our body bodily rights and you know how we interact with one one another and other people so yeah i thought it was great what did you guys make of it i think it's also it's where rape is so taboo in terms of discussions around it that that victims coming forward and, ex- and talking about their experiences is still very hard and it's very difficult now we've got social media and people can explain you know ex- um, express things anonymously but what we've got to understand is that if we don't create safe space for people to talk about this and normalize 
being victims of, of abuse and how they can overcome it and seeking the right help, then we're not going to be able to then actually kind of circumnavigate the problem and actually help the victims as well as create understanding by people sharing their stories. And if people are not brave enough and, and safe enough to share those experiences, then we're not going to be able to reinforce that learning and actually create more awareness of what's going on and why it's so important to really tackle this problem from a holistic standpoint. Mm. What are your thoughts on it? Um, I'd never seen consent spelled out like that before, so yeah. I thought that was really, really powerful. It's the most important thing. But then it also highlighted to me just how basic we are in this country when it <laughs> comes to consent and, it, and just how bad the situation is. There's so many different instances um, throughout that uh, people would just brush off here. I, I, I liken it to, um, well, Norway, or was it Norway or Sweden? I think it's Sweden. Rape there has, has, has got some different different high levels of consent. So if you... If you sleep with a woman and you're a married man, but you tell her you're gonna leave your wife and you don't leave your wife, that's rape. Because you, she offered, well, she proceeded to sleep with you on the basis of information mm -hmm. that was incorrect. So you have misled her um, and that's how high level their, excuse me, that's how high level their levels of consent are. And we look at what it is in this country and what ends up what people end up going to court or not. I just think to myself, we, we are so far behind. And I think that's what, that's what it spelled out for me watching it, just how far behind we are. And what we've discussed educating young boys in particular about understanding consent and, and sexual violence and just, I quote, just disrespect on a very basic level towards women. What are the practical things that you can do in this borough to ensure that women feel safer? Well, firstly, it's taking all of those precautions. Um, all of the things that women are asked to do themselves, walk on a certain type of street, do this, do that. It's, I think locally, it's about doing those things for them. Make things better lit, uh, make areas safe. At the moment, there's a lot of issues about police patrols, given the sensitivities mm. around all of that. But um, in a situation where they felt safe around officers, you would have that presence. You'd have better reporting. Um, mechanism. So actually making it, I, I spoke earlier about how in response to the um, into the appeal for Sarah Everard, loads of women came forward about things that happened to them in the past. Why do women not feel comfortable reporting these things? Two reasons they don't feel comfortable because of the society we live in and because they know that nothing will happen. Changing that and changing the, the resources which they have to report these issues and talk about them and actually see justice, I think would change that and also change at the other side of it, uh, whether or not men came forward and did it. And also just looking at education again um, within our schools, making sure we have great organisations like yours coming in and talking mm. to people, making sure it's central to um, PSHE, yeah. I think it's called. <laughs> and, um, and I suppose whenever, what, well, this happens in all areas of equality, whenever things get tough with funding or anything, the first things to go are the measures that, um, that, that support minority groups. And, and in our case, it's really weird to call women a minority group because we actually make up with the majority of the population. Yeah. We just have less of the power. Yes. Um, and in, in, in terms of race, obviously numbers and less power together. So whenever, whenever things get tough in terms of money, those are the first things to go. But it has to be central to our education system, not an add-on, not a kind of luxury that you know, we have young people learning about consent. Um, and just final point I want to put to you guys. I want to discuss the element of, of race in the women who are believed and protected. And if you think that the racism does play a role in who, the, the, in, in who we protect, do, do, do you guys feel that there, is, there are some women who are prioritised and, and believed and protected and others who are not? Is there institutional racism? You want to say it, but you know what I mean? Apparently there's a report about that. <laughs> is, is it fair to suggest that black women are going to be, are less believed and are less protected than everybody else when it comes to sexual assault and rape? Absolutely. Um, I think a recently a statistic came out that black people are four times more likely to go missing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amount of resources they were put into looking to them or, or looking at what happened vastly different. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised by that at all. I mean, we compare the case of Sarah Everard to that of uh, Blessing or mm -hmm. And, you know, the amount of resources that were put in, um, the amount of time um, before they shut it down. But it's not, it's not even just in instances like that. It's right across the justice system. So you see Christopher Capessa from Wells, Shukri Abdi. Um, every single time when it comes to... Uh, um, any single time it comes to that situation, you have a, you have 
much less resources, much less police time, and so quick to w wind it down. Um, there's nothing more to see here. Blessing was outside of her home by a seaside town. All of her stuff is laying neatly on the beach, and they said she must have drowned. Who does that? Mm -hmm. um, and even just little things, just thinking about it, even think about her hair. What black woman is going to go into the sea with a weave? At that? You, and, 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 and it sounds ridiculous, but no, 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 just no. investigating, it, taking on board little things like that, it's not going to happen. But they've concluded it must have been an accident and it's finished and that's it. And what, no. are, you do, what are you doing as an MP to try and push back to make sure that black women are treated as fairly as, as, as white women? Well, firstly, locally, when issues are raised um, and individuals are raised, making sure those are getting pushed more, but also just 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 challenging um, the situation within Parliament, which is going to be a lot more difficult now that they've claimed that institutional <laughs> racism doesn't exist because they they want to be less willing to look at it through that lens. But we have to continue looking at it through that lens. I mean, I always say, as as citizens, we're we're under policed um, completely, um, and we're over policed as as victims. It, 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 we just we just no over police the citizens, under police the yes, victims, yes, the other way around. Yes. Um, and, and, and that situation mm. makes our whole lives different, um, right from you know, how, how we'll come through work, how we'll come through school, what we're able to achieve, but also whether or not anybody cares when we die mm. and, and bad things happen to us. Um, we have just as much, much right as anybody else, and those need to be respected. But you're only going to do that if you first acknowledge there is a problem, there is that institutional racism, and then you have to take measures and as well as targets mm -hmm. to looking at changing them. So if we have a situation that you know carries to go on that black people continue to go missing, black people's cases are not being um, being investigated, then we know it's not working. But you have to admit it, then you have to be willing to check yourself constantly and take action. That's what the government need to do. Okay. Um, I want to finish just on, 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 on the boys and the men. And because I think we started by talking and agreeing that this is something that they need to address. They've got to do the work. Um, just coming back to uh, Sais and, and yourself, why are boys, if they are still resisting understanding what it is they need to do to ensure that they are treating women better? And, and what is the practical work that you're doing with your organisation to ensure that cases that we've seen over the last few weeks that have been highlighted don't happen again? I mean, I think to answer the first part, why are they resisting it? Because it's something that is completely somewhat foreign to them in terms of a mainstream narrative. There's literally no way in which that we actually call up men, call on men, hold men accountable in so many different contexts and ways. And so that's something that's actually to them is like, well, why are you doing that to me now? You know, we talk about entitlement and all these different things that we haven't touched upon, but that plays a massive part in why kind of people feel essentially attacked when you pretty much state a fact to them. We'll, we'll, we'll develop that. We've got, we've got time. So what role does entitlement do you think play in, in, in the disrespect of women and, and how men treat women? I mean, I can only speak to this as a woman. Like, I don't, I'm, I'm not a man, and I have a lived experience as a man. So, I, it's actually something that genuinely fascinates me. This, this issue of entitlement, this idea that they think and genuinely believe, and I, you know, I've seen it before my eyes. I've been, you know, had it happen to me, but like that, they can take what they want. They can do what they want. And there is no repercussions. There's no real consequences. And the only time there are sort of consequences, they only care about those consequences when it's about them, you know, and it's about them. So if they're doing something and taking something, then you're worried about being held up about it because they don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to be seen as bad. They don't want to be badly misrepresented with their mates or their boys, whatever, as opposed to actually the harm they've caused to that other person. And so it, again, it is a phenomenon to me in some ways, like this this male entitlement and the way that it plays out and the way that it actually controls everything that we we do and the way that we have to kind of tolerate certain uh, systems that are are affecting our lives, affecting the way in which people are protected or caught, thought about, valued. Um, and I think that it's a huge thing that often you know, is difficult, particularly for young boys to talk about because they like just came into this world and mm. had all of it and it was mm. all there, you know, like they didn't get, they don't know when you're eight years old that you've just got all this kind of male entitlement. It's just like, not to say that it's like handed to you, no. but it is just something that exists there that doesn't really get talked about. You know, growing up as, as a young girl, you, you understand like, I don't have that space. Like I can't get away with that. I shouldn't be doing that. You know, and you some in some spaces physically shrink yourself, you know, that we went back at the beginning, this boys will be boys, like boys playing and fighting and, you know, the fact that that was just normal and just is left completely un uninterrupted. So I think that that's, I've digressed again. 
Uh, no, 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 but <laughs> like I, I hugely. Would say, but yeah, I mean, with the young boys that we're working with, that a lot of them like have a minimal emotional regulation, but have a maximum, you know, emotional frustration because the society is telling them every day that they're not going to go anywhere, that they're not going to go forward in education, that they're going to go to prison. You can only, only be a football player or a musician, like. There's certain roots into society that are not visible and viable for them. So when they feel this every day, and then they're getting, you know, uh, excluded at a higher rate and going to people of fair units and being left to, to basically rot within society, no one cares about them. And they have this now, and, and when they feel that they there's a power dynamic, especially in a woman, where they feel that they can get one over on a woman, that makes them feel better because they have such self value, a low self value, and this is where they feel that you know what, I don't have to wait for anything. I can take what I want. This is why I can go out and rob somebody. This is why I can go out and do this because my emotional regulation is very low and my emotional kind of self-worth is very low. And these are the things that I have to do to make myself feel better. So this is once we get to the crux of that and get into to understand themselves and what are they doing and how that impacts other people, then they're going to be more responsible because they're going to be reinforcing that decision making and practicing it more. So that's what we've got to really kind of regulate young people and make sure that we're forcing them to, to be outside their comfort zone so that they reinforce that learning at a higher rate. Are you all hopeful? Are you all hopeful that young boys are, are going to grow up better than, than the current generation of young boys and older men? Or do recent events, some of the most high profile events, make you concerned that actually we're not making the progress that we need to be making? I'm hopeful if they get given what they need, like, but that's not what's happening, mm. you know? And so you say, like, organisations like this doing this, you know, there's, there's no funding, we don't have any money, you know, this is too much, maybe next time, or can we fit this into an hour? Yeah. Like, no. <laughs> you get, there, this, we're talking about hundreds of years mm. here, hundreds mm. of years of influence on what this, like, current society sits at. And so I'm hopeful if we actually can do the work and people value the work and see the importance of what it is to actually provide young boys and young men with these spaces to talk. But at the same time as well, I think that, as we often talk about, you know, young boys, but it isn't just dependent on them either. You know, it is dependent on us as, as adults, as, as elders and all these different things, because if they go into a space, let's say they go into a workshop and they hear these things and they learn new things and they can learn to articulate themselves. And then they go back to a teacher or they go back home and their parents have no idea what they're talking about. And they turn on the TV and they don't see it again. You know, like it's almost as if that, that, that work not gets cancelled out, but then yeah. it's like, where do you go with it? So you can do tons of work with young men and boys but it has to be a community that does it together it has to be their whole kind of social circle that's committed to it as well and I think that's where again I'm like not that I'm less hopeful but where, where are the resources for that you know where's the priority for that where's the priority to genuinely actually find time for everyone no matter what your age is to kind of talk about these things and understand how we're harming ourselves and harming other people so I don't think that it's completely pessimistic but I do think that it's it does feel uh, frustrating because there are these dips of interest you know like we had black lives matter last summer and suddenly everyone cares about black people and that, that lasted <laughs> 10 minutes you know which did and then now like and then obviously we said women and everyone cares about women more care about white women that happened again and now everyone's already everyone's already a little bit bored of it you know like when you see it happening on social media or you see it happening on the tv like it just does disappear and so in that sense it's extremely frustrating to know that this is like it, that our lives have almost become the, the value of human life has become this weird like social media type trend it, it's so in that sense that sounds quite dark I'm gonna stop <laughs> no, I know you mean, I know you mean. yeah it's true but you are hopeful as long as the, the right tools are in place to to action the work that's been done in in in, in places like yours and, and say so. yeah as long as it's put as, as this is put as a priority do you know what I mean and I think that's a huge thing and so you could and not and I understand as well and I I'm very conscious of the fact you know we work with teachers too of how overworked uh, teachers are how they don't have the right resources and they're not compensated for their time and I understand that we're talking about so many different stress systems here trying to actually work in tandem with one another and that's very difficult but I do think that yeah if that if that work is done and we actually really do prioritise and value the well-being of, of young people, but us as a society as a whole, then then I think that it would it has a lot of potential. I hear you. Um, Casey, Bell and Sage, thank you so much for joining me on this week's show. Really important discussion. As I said at the start there, I think we need to be better. We need to be teaching, but I agree. We need the tools and the infrastructures to enable us to action a lot of the work that's being done. Um, check out some of our other content on here on blackademic.com. Follow us across all of our social platforms. We'll put some links also, some articles and some things you should check out with regards to this subject itself in our description below. Until next time, peace. <laughs>